Hello and God bless you. Well, today we continue our series about the end times, following in with what we were have lined out on our outline of the end times. Today we'll be talking about the Battle of Armageddon. In the Battle of Armageddon, like with different things that we've talked about, several of our videos, we mentioned how when you study it out, people have different theories of how these things are going to come about. And the Battle of Armageddon is just like it. Because, you know, there's different end time wars that are talked about in the Bible. Psalm 83, Zechariah 12, Ezekiel 38 and 39. You know, all these, there's all these different battles mentioned. And some believe that they are all the same. And, like I said, I don't know. So you'll have to study it out for yourself. You can form your own theories. God hadn't given me his day planner. I don't know exactly how this thing's going to play out. But I'm going to try to give you everything that the Bible has to say about the Battle of Armageddon. We're going to try to give you just what the Bible says. And like I said, read it for yourself because we may bring out some stuff today that maybe it's a different battle. I don't, you know. Like I said, we don't, we don't know. It hadn't happened yet. But first things first. With the Battle of Armageddon, some believe that it's going to be a spiritual war something that'll be done in the spiritual realm that we here on earth who are alive and remain will not physically see happen in the natural and others believe that it will be a physical war that we can see in the physical we can see it in the natural you know just like any battle that happens you know we can turn on world news or something like that and see it on the news being reported live and I believe that this will be a physical war and I believe Jesus confirms that in Matthew 24 30 when he says and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the man, Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And this verse also is one of those where people have different theories. Some believe that this is talking about when Jesus comes in the clouds for the rapture. And some believe it's when he's coming to destroy the evil of the world in the battle of Armageddon. And Zechariah chapter 12 in the war it talks about there in Zechariah 12 10 it talks about how the children the children of Israel the people that are in Israel will see the Son of Man appear in this in the clouds of heaven and they're gonna mourn for the one in whom they pierced So like I said, I believe it is going to be a physical war, and I believe that Jesus confirms it here, but read it for yourself. Don't take my word or anybody else's for it. And we're going to see the very first and only time that the word Armageddon is mentioned. And this is in Revelation 16:16, 16, 16, and it says, And he gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. And soon when people think about this battle and they hear Armageddon, they think of disaster and, you know, all this fear comes on them. But if we have Jesus Christ in our life, if we have made him the Lord of our life, then there's nothing for us to fear. Because the battle of Armageddon, we believe it to be the battle when God is going to destroy the, the evil of this world and if we have not taken the mark 
and started following the beast, then we're going to be fine if we're still here. Battle of Armageddon is, we believe it to be when God will destroy all the evil of the world and wrap this thing up. So we don't need to fear if we have Jesus in our life. If we have made him the Lord and Savior of our life, we have nothing to fear when the battle of Armageddon comes. And because Armageddon, the word as it says right here, it's a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. Armageddon comes from the Hebrew word Har Megiddo and Har means a mountain or a hill or hill country and Megiddo means a place of Manasseh which which means that in Joshua in the book of Joshua when he's dividing the land he's dividing you know when they come to the promised land and he divides the land by the, the by the tribes he gives them each a section of land Megiddo this valley that we're talking about that this war is going to happen it came in the lot the inheritance land of Manasseh and we know that it is a future location where God is going to intervene and destroy the armies of the Antichrist and the people who sided with him and all the nations that are gathered to fight against Jesus. And it's believed that Revelation 19 describes the Battle of Armageddon. And we're going to read that right now. Starting in verse 11, it says, And I saw the heavens open. And behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doeth judge and make war and his eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had the name written that no man knew but he himself and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name was called the Word of God. In Revelation 14, I think it's verses 18 through 20, it talks about how it talks about the wine press and all, and the blood coming up to the to basically the the saddle of the horses. So this boat could be where his vesture is dipped in blood because he's probably you know after he destroys these people his the blood is going to be so high up that it's going to cover most of the horse and dip in you know and his clothes are going to be dipped into the blood as he comes and let's go on to the next verse and it says and his armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen white and clean and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that it should smite the nations and he shall rule with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of the almighty God and that's what we're talking about when we mentioned you know the wine press because we believe that that will be what will happen is that Jesus is going to be go going through the blood there And we're going to go on to the next verse when it says, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And there's something interesting here. 
when it talks about he had a on his vesture and on his thigh a name written King of King and Lord of Lords people kind of describe that as maybe being a tattoo or something but if you think about the shawls that the Jewish people wear you know on each side uh, where you know because on the part that rests like on the back of their neck there's like this uh, um, collar you know and it has a uh, has written on it a prayer that they pray whenever they put the robe on or the the, the little shawl thing on and on the very uh, on the other end of that is it's just a straight seam but on the opposite sides because it's, it's like a rectangle or possibly square I mean if you get a, a nice one that's really nice and fancy but but on the other two ends on uh, in the middle part of those you're going to see a bunch of um, threads that are tied together and there's a bunch of them and they all represent um, the Levitical laws that God you know tells the Israelites to do and on the very ends at the very corners of each of them there is a a long strand of thread called the seat seat and this is interesting because there's knots on it and each knot r resembles you know, it, it's a part of the letter of, of the name of God and that long thread is made out of 39 threads and the interesting thing is that our Jewish brothers and sisters don't know Jesus yet they when they pray for healing they grab these long threads the seat seat they grab them in both hands and they pray and they're in you know, and then in the in between their fingers those knots that resemble the name of God you know go right there in between their fingers and they're literally grabbing 39 threads as they pray for healing which as we know Jesus had 39 straps on his back that paid for our healing so that's kind of but anyway that thing like I said it's got the knot set that um, spell out the name of God so I believe that when it's talking about because it says on his vesture and on his thigh so I believe it's that seat seat hanging off his his um, shawl and resting there on his thigh as he's riding his horse and now we're going to says and I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the fowls of the, that fly in the midst of heaven come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of the mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men both free and bond both small and great now as we see there that kind of sounds like it's talking about the Gog and Magog that we talk about because it is talking about eating the flesh of kings and stuff but and it says and I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army and the beast was and the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him which deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image these both were cast in the lake of fire burning with brimstone and the remnant were slain in the, with the sword of him that sat upon the horse with the sword proceeding out of his mouth and all the fowls of 
were filled with their flesh. And as we, if you study it out about Megiddo, you're going to see that that a lot's happened in that region. The plain of Megiddo is about 60 miles north of Jerusalem. There's been more than 200 battles that have been fought in that region of the valley of Armageddon, Megiddo. And the valley was famous for two great victories in Israel's history. The first was Barak's victory over the Canaanites, and this is in Judges 4.15, and it says, And the Lord disconfirmed Sisera, if I suppose if I have to pronounce that right, and all his chariots and all his hosts with the edge of the sword before Barak, so that Sisera lightened down off his chariot and fled away on his feet. So that was the first victory that happened in the in the valley of Armageddon and Megiddo. In the second, we will see in Judges chapter 7, and this is when Gideon had a victory over the Midianites. And as we'll see here, it's going to be Judges 7, 16, and it says, And he divided the th 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with an empty pitcher and lamps within the pitchers. And we're going to go ahead and read 16 through 25 just to kind of show you what this what happened this in this second victory and it says in 17 and he said unto them look on me and do likewise and behold when I come to the outside of the camp it shall be that as I do so shall you do and when I blow the trumpet I and all that are with me then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of the camp all the camp and say the sword of the Lord and of Gideon so Gideon and the 300 men that were with him came into the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch and they had but newly set the watch and they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in their hands And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hand and the trumpets in their right hands to blow withal. And they cried the sword of the Lord and Gideon, of Gideon. And they stood every man in his place round about the camp and all the host ran and cried and fled. And the three hundred blew the trumpets and the Lord said, Every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the hosts. And the host fled to Bethshanah in Zerath. Sorry if I mispronounce these words. To the border of Amalek. Uh, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that. And Tabith. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali and out of Asher and out of all of Manasseh and pursued after the Midianites. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim saying come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters unto Bethborah and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters of Bethrim and Jordan. And they took the two princes of the Midianites 
Orb and Zeb, and they slew Orb upon the rock of Orb, and Zeb they slew at the winepress of Zeb, and pursued Midian, and brought the heads of Orb and Zeb to Gideon in the other, on the other side of Jordan. So anyway, that's the two victories that happened. Two major victories that you'll read about if you study the word out for yourself that happened in the Valley of Armageddon. And there are also, in the Valley of Armageddon, it was also the site of two great tragedies. The first being the death of Saul and his sons. And we see that in 1 Samuel 31. 8 which says and it came to pass on the morrow when the Philistines came and stripped the slain that they found Saul and his sons and his three sons they are fallen in Mount Geba and this is also in 1st Chronicles 10 8 which says and it came to pass on the morrow when the Philistines came to strip the slain that they found Saul and his sons fallen in Mount Geba and the second is the death of King Joah, Josiah. And this was in 2 Kings 23, 29 and 30. And it says in the days Pharaoh, I don't know how to pronounce that word, word, King of Egypt went up against the king of Assyria to the river Euphrates. And King Josiah went against against him and he slew him at Megiddo when he had seen him and his servants carried him in a chariot dead from Megiddo and brought him to Jerusalem and buried him in his own sepulcher and the people of the land took Jehoshaphat the son of Josiah and anointed him king and made him king in his father's steed and this is also in Second Chronicles 35:22, which says, Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself that he might fight against him, fight with him. And he hearkened not unto the words of Necho from the mouth of God, and came and fight to fight in the valley of Megiddo. So as we see here, these are times when two times when tragedy had struck in the Valley of Megiddo because you know that because it says, says here Josiah wasn't was told not to go but now we're going to kind of focus on what is said in Revelation 19 15 and it says out of his mouth go with a sharp sword that it should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of, of Almighty God and we kind of see other verses that kind of describe how God's going to destroy the evil of this world out of here it says that Jesus is going to come on a light horse and out of his mouth go with a sharp sword and we know that uh, the Word of God is called a sharp two-edged sword. So it's possibly Jesus is just going to speak. And just the power of his breath from his speech is just going to wipe everybody out. That's against him. Like I said, we don't know for sure. Because, you know, it hadn't happened yet. And, and like I said, we only, we only see... God's plan through a knot hole. But Second Thessalonians two eight says Then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and he shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So see right there it's confirming that with the spirit of his mouth, so believe it's going to be just like a word like he's just going to speak something I don't know if it'll be like just one word or 
Or maybe he's just going to say, y'all are all dead. I mean, who knows? Like I said, I have no idea. God hadn't given me that knowledge of what was what's going to happen to destroy these folks, but we do know that it's going to happen. And Isaiah 11, 4 also talks about it. And it says, But the righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equality for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he lay the wicked. And we believe that's how God's going to destroy the evil of this world. Jesus is going to speak the word of God and just consume them all. But anyway, that's kind of the Battle of Armageddon. Like I said, we don't know. I don't know for sure. You know, this battle is also ones that we previously read about in the Old Testament. And, or if it's going to be different. Like I said, I do not have God's day planner. So read the word for yourself. You know, form your own opinion about it. Maybe you'll find something in there that I didn't see. Study it out. Don't take my word or anybody else's for it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give God glory. I look forward to see what the Lord has for us next time. And like I said, I do have to have a video that an idea that God laid on my heart. That does have something to do with what we're going through in this world right now. And I think it will be interesting. But we'll probably bring it out after we're done with what we have outlines. And as I've said, as we've done these end time videos, I do not have the answers of what exactly is going to happen and when it's going to happen and where. All we have is the Word of God, and I've tried to give you what the Word of God says. But I don't have his day planner. I don't know what's going to happen. Like I, like I said, I do believe that we see God's plan in God through a knot hole on a fence. You know, you think about a wooden fence, and there's a, a hole out where, you know, one of the knots in the wood got poked out and that's how we're seeing the picture we're not getting the full picture of God in the Bible it talks about that we see through a glass darkly that's like thinking about you ever tried to appear through somebody's tinted windows of their car try to see if somebody's in there you know you can't really see all that well because the the glass is dark you can kind of see in there a little bit you kind of see some shapes you might see the a headrest or something but you can't you can't see fully in there because it's dark that's how the how it's described that we're gonna see the picture of God we're gonna get his plan we're never gonna get the full picture I think even when even when we're we've died and went into heaven I don't think we're still gonna know all of his plan because it's for him to know Next to the word of God does confirm that because um, when it talk, Jesus talks about for that day and the hour, no, not, no, no man, not even the angels in heaven, but the, the Father only. So, you know, even, if, even when we get to heaven, we're not going to be able to ask God, well, hey, what's going to happen when this goes down? You know, he's going to go, wait and see. You're up here. You're not having to be afflicted by the sin and everything. Just watch what I do. But, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be great to, to, not, to be able to come back to this world and not be able to be burdened down with the sins of this world, messing up before God. Because like I always say, you know, for me, I love the Lord so much and I'm so grateful to everything he's done for me. And I always get so upset with myself when I mess up because... You know, God didn't have to call me back. 
He didn't have to call you back. He didn't have to call any of us. So whenever I mess up, I'm like, I'm so glad you, that God is a forgiving God. And He's a loving God. Because honestly, you know, I think it was up to me. I'd say, get out of here, God. You've done, you, you messed up too much. But I'm so glad that God's not like that. Like I say, just to close it, I love you. God bless you. I hope you have a great week. Read the word for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Be constant communication with God because like I said, we don't know when this thing's going to happen. It could be in the next second. It could be the next minute, the next hour, the next day, the next month, the next year, the next 10 years, the next 100 years next thousand years who knows but what we do know is one day God's word does say that he is going to end this and we got to be ready we're not guaranteed tomorrow we got to have our heart ready so pray every day read God's word make sure that anything any out of word any sin anything that may be that may have you separated from God Pray that Jesus put, that God covers that under the blood of Jesus. And he doesn't have to. It's not a do this, God, because I want you to do it. He's not going to do it. He does he'll forgive us for our sins because he loves us. But it's not a guarantee. He does that because he loves us and he wants to have a relationship with us. So get everything covered. Because, you know, if your if your time's called, if your number's punched. You don't want anything that will make God say, Depart from me, work of iniquity, I never knew you. You want him to say, Come on in here, God. I can't wait to can't wait to have a relationship with you. Come on in. That's what you want to hear. So, you know, read the word for yourself. Keep a constant relationship with God. Make him the Lord of your life. Make him the number one priority. Make sure that a day doesn't, that, the, that it each, as you lay down to sleep before you sleep for the next day, make sure everything's covered. I can't wait to see what the Lord has for us next week. If you enjoyed this, give God glory. I love you. God bless you. We'll see you next week. God willing, have a great week.